It's Biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me! Hello, hello, hello. Let's get rid of that. Check I'm still recording. I am. I've actually already done this lesson once in full and realised I hadn't actually pressed record. So let's actually try to start this now. So, welcome, hello, if you're watching. Um, I have just made a little voiceover to this PowerPoint to help uh, non-specialists when you're in a paired lesson uh, still give you as much of a biology-based experience of a practical that I'd like you all to do during this rest respiration topic um, in year 10 whilst we're in this situation. So, these face-to-face -face lessons. Your job, guys, is to plan an investigation that will answer the following hypothesis in red. My hypothesis I've given is that when you exercise, your heart rate and breathing rate change. Your job is to design, plan a method that will answer that hypothesis. So I need you to plan an investigation that will produce data that will help us answer this question. And don't get me wrong, I know you know the answer. I know you know what's going to happen when you exercise to your heart rate and breathing rate. That's, that's you know, my three-year-old and four, my three-year-old probably knows that. The key thing is, I need you to practice the skills involved with designing an investigation, performing an investigation, and analysing the investigation. These are skills essential to your GCSE, which is why it's such a good thing to do in these face-to-face -face lessons. So this is a plan. You are writing a method in this period, in this lesson. And what I'd like you to consider is, as you're writing your steps and telling people what to do, have you considered your variables? Have you considered what you're changing in the investigation? Have you considered what you're going to measure in the investigation and, and how you're going to do that? You know. You know, don't just say measure this. Tell the student or whoever you're writing this method for how they're going to measure it. Have you talked about control variables? What are you going to keep the same to ensure your test is valid? Valid, by the way, is just a scientific way of saying fair test. Fair test is very primary school. We don't actually say that at GCC. We just say valid instead. Results. So, like. How are you going to record your results? You can't do an investigation if you haven't got a results table already set up and ready to go. Finally, risks. If you're going to perform an experiment, perform a practical, you need to identify what risks there are and explain how or what you are doing to minimise those risks. So, good luck in your plan. Obviously, you're welcome to you're welcome to repeat or pause me and go back to the start. That's absolutely fine if you want this instruction again. But the key idea is you are now planning an investigation either by yourself or I put you at the top in small socially distanced groups. So you know if you're going to plan something together, you know, don't share paper, don't share pens, but obviously just have that conversation in your workstations. Um, near each other but obviously don't make it so loud that your teacher wants to shout at you you know be good so i'm now going to start talking um about how we go about marking checking the results uh, checking your plan so when students are ready for that you can press play again but if students are just cracking on designing then keep me pause keep me quiet thanks very much okie dokie you've got a plan you've got a method in front of you I'd recommend getting a green pen in front of you as well. Let's actually try and mark what you have done. This ain't going to be perfect, because obviously you might have all planned completely different things, but I'll do my best to give you sort of the general ideas that hopefully you've definitely considered. Before I start, I'd like to sing a little song. Are you ready? The independent variables, the one you change. Independent variables, the one you change. Dependent one you measure. If you don't, you feel displeasure. The independent variables, the one you change. Independent variable goes on the x-axis. Independent variable goes on the x-axis. Dependent one flies high on the axis known as y. Independent variable goes on the x. 
x-axis. Control variable stay the same. Control variable stay the same. It's so you can compare and the test you do is valid. Control variable stay the same. Whew. X factor, here I come. Right, so independent variable. You must have changed something in your investigation. This one's actually a little bit weird. It's actually one that I think students might actually struggle to realise that's what they're changing. But chances are, what you're changing, if you've, you know, okay, presumably you've, you've not done something wild and fancy, then what you're changing is actually whether you're measuring your heart rate or breathing rate before or after exercise. So the change is almost at one point I will handle exercise and now I have. So the before and after exercising ideas it could actually be your independent variable. So yeah. But this also gives rise to what a dependent variable, what we're measuring. But obviously, you know, the measure, the measurement of this change would be the dependent. So, you know, how actually physically measuring your pulse rate or measuring your breathing rate would be the dependent variable. But guys, if you've put in your plan, measure your pulse rate, but you haven't actually said how then that's not good enough, and that will need your green pen and blue pen to make improvements, please. So if you want to measure your pulse rate, so fingers on wrists or neck, or you might be one of those weird people that gets a pulse in their like toe or something, I don't know, but you need to find your pulse, measure how many pulses you get, say, for 15 seconds, and then multiply that number by four, and that will give you a, uh, a rate per minute. Same for breathing rate, you might count how many breaths you take in 15 seconds, and then times that by four, give you a breathing rate per minute. Control variables are what you're going to keep the same. And again, this, this will change depending on what you've planned. So some of you might be doing it all yourself. Now we'll stress this guys. If you've just decided to do one, like one exercise, if you're doing it all yourself, and if you've not done any repeats, then that's not going to be a very valid investigation. How do you know the one time you've done it isn't an anomaly? How do you know it's actually true? How do you know it's valid? So if you're doing it yourself, I'd recommend you have at least three repeats. Minimum, three repeats. If you're doing it in a small group, now then we've got to consider, you know, it's like four of you are doing the same thing, hopefully. Or if you're doing the same type of exercise, that's a control variable. If you're doing it for the same number of minutes, that's a control variable. If you're doing the same intensity of exercise, very difficult to control in a school, very, very difficult. But obviously, if you had things like treadmills, you'd be able to get the same intensity, wouldn't you? Uh, if all the, the small group of you have the same age, that's a control variable. Uh, guys, I know there might be like a few months between you, but I promise you, the fact you're in a year group, that means you are the same age. That That's absolutely fine. Same previous fitness level might be, dif might be different. Um, that again, it depends on the groups you work with, you might not be able to control. But if you're working by yourself and doing repeats, these are still true. You know, working by yourself, you've guaranteed same previous fitness level and same age, haven't you? Working by yourself, in your repeats, you've just got to make sure you're doing the same type of exercise. The only thing I would stress, and this is an extra control variable if you are doing repeats, you need. Ideally, after you've done your first first go, to allow your heart rate or breathing rate, whichever one you're measuring, to go back to normal, to rest, before you start the next exercise. Results. Your results table. As an examiner, I am looking only at the heading. Does your results table have headings, and do those headings have units where appropriate? And have you put them in the right columns? Is the independent variable in the left-hand column and dependent in the right-hand column? And guys, you can learn that really nicely because think of your song. Which one comes first? The independent variable is the one you change. So that's the one that goes in the left-hand column at the start of that page. I'll just show you what my results table, if I was to do, I'm just going to check I am still recording. <laughs> hey, I still am. It, it's, I'm work. Hey, it, it's just working this time. I'm happy. So if you have got a results table, guys, pencil and rulers, you know, don't be daft. 
Why are you so small? Oh well, it might it might randomly get bigger. I just adjust it or so. Um, so what I'm looking for, guys, I'm looking for your headings for you know independent variable, dependent variable. So let's say I've just done an investigation by myself because you know why not? Um, so I've done three repeats uh, of the same thing, and I've I've measured my pulse rate before and after exercise each time. So my independent variable is whether it's before or after exercise. There's no unit for that. No unit for that. And my dependent variable is, uh, I guess, heart rate in, let's say I did it in beats per minute. So I measured it for 15 seconds and times by four. So because I'm doing it three times, I actually need four columns this side for go number one, two, three, and the mean. But on this side, I just need the words before and after. So let's say on the first go, my heart rate before exercise was 60, and then after exercise went up to 94. Why not? Let's say on the second go, my heart rate was 60. I got it back down to 62, just you know, basically, basically where resting was. And afterwards, it got to 98. Why not? And on the third go, let's say it was 61. I got it down to, and then when I exercise, it went all the way up to 120 because I'm a bit of a noob and I just I, I didn't control my intensity. So my means would be I've got to add all three up and divide by three. Divide by the number there are. So 60 plus 62 plus 61 divided by three. I don't need a calculator. That's just 61. Uh, great. How am I going to do this in my head? 94 plus 98 plus 120 in my head is. 300 minus 320 minus 6, 312, and 312 divided by 3 is going to be 104. In my head, oh yeah. Hopefully, you've just got access to a calculator, guys. You don't have to go through the effort that I'm going through. So, I've got my results. I've got my results table. Beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Risk assessment. Have you considered the risks involved? If you've designed an investigation where you're doing some exercise, preferably, hopefully you've done exercise outside, that will be, if your teacher lets you actually do this practical, they will make you outside to do it. You know, it might have been raining on the field. Are you wearing the correct footwear? Have you took precautions that maybe if it is wet, that maybe you might do it on the path instead? You know, have you actually thought about what you're doing there? Um, okay, the, the one I've done about being sweaty, swearing extra deodorant, that is just for a laugh, but you know, I remember what your year group smells like, so deodorant is always a very good idea um, for, for, for me, for, to the risk you pose on me and my nasal cavity. Okay, doing the experiment has to be uh, controlled by your teacher, guys, and in all fairness, uh, your teacher should not really allow you outside to do it if they haven't checked your method. You know, we don't. We have to make sure that what you're doing is safe, and uh, and also we we'll actually produce results that will prove or disprove that original hypothesis. Uh, your coronavirus rules, guys. It must be done outside. Uh, if you're heavy breathing in an enclosed room with little ventilation, which is what you know the schools' rooms are, um, obviously that increases risk of transmission. So done outside is better. Supervision of your lead biology teacher, so don't just go wander off around the school and do it somewhere else. Do it where your biology teacher can see you. And obviously it must be social distance to everyone else, both students and staff. Okay, uh, the next part of this, so again, pause me if you don't want to. Next part of this is, okay, you've done the experiment, you've got your data. What graph are you going to draw? General rule of thumb, guys. Again, I can't help myself. Am I still recording? Still recording. Ooh. General rule of thumb here. It's all about the independent variable. If the independent variable has a range, e.g., let's say you've measured width. Obviously, you wouldn't for this experiment, but let's say in an experiment, if independent variable is the width of something. Well, Width 
has an unlimited range. It can be zero centimetres all the way up to a billion and trillion million infinity centimetres with all the decimal places and decimal points in between. That's a fuller range. So that would end up being a line graph. But if your independent variable has categories, so let's say, you know, colour of cars, so it's either, you know, there's no range there. It's either blue or it's red or it's green or it's purple or it's, you know, insert name of car colour here. Um, there's no range of that. There's no decimal places of blue. And therefore, OK, it is. If, there is if you talk wavelength, but no one's going to do that. Not, not, not in a biology lesson, at least. That's, uh, save that for physics for now. Um, if it's in categories, well, that, that's where you do your bar chart. So look at your independent variable. Mine was before or after exercise. So mine has categories. Mine is categoric data. So in my example, I would draw a bar chart. If yours is categories as well, like mine, you will draw a bar chart. If yours, you know, actually had a measurement and that measurement, you know, you've got infinite answers because you've got infinite decimal places it could be. That is when you draw a line graph. The likelihood here is nearly every single person in the room, hopefully, probably has a bar chart. Yeah, come on, you can do it. So, have a go. Draw your bar chart, line graph, whatever you think is appropriate for your data. And uh, yeah, pause me if you don't want to mark your graphs. But if you're all done, you can play me. Let's mark your graphs. Here's what I'm looking for. Actually, sorry, I will just stress. I pop here assess your graphs at the top. I appreciate that might not be appropriate. It might make more sense just to assess your own. However, you know, if you're in a room and, you know, where, all right, you might be socially distanced, but you can still see each other's work, so you can, like, hold it up and such, then, of course, you can peer assess. They can give you verbal feedback, and you can write that verbal feedback in green as a what one well read the better. Of course you can. So I am looking for an independent variable. Whatever the thing you changed is, that has to be on the x-axis. Remember your song. Independent variable goes on the x. And if it has a unit, you need to put it. My example didn't have a unit, so I wouldn't have put it. It would have just been before or after exercise, that's it. Dependent variable. If flight dependent from one place high on the axis known as Y, and again, has to have its correct unit. So if you've measured heart rate, okay, heart rate in beats per minute, or breathing rate in beats per minute. The scales on both axes increase evenly. Let me show you what I mean by that. Come on. So if you've got an axis here on the dependent variable side, and let's say it starts at zero nicely, and let's say you go up to the first sort of main main point and say that's 10, and that's 20. You can see I'm going up kind of like two of my little lines. I'm not going up two. It's going up two line spaces of mine, but it looks different on, on the screen randomly. I'm kind of going up evenly, aren't I? 10, 20, 30. Let's say I go up the same distance, but I make that one 35. And then I go back up to 50 there. Well, I might be increasing, but I'm not increasing the scale evenly. And therefore, that's not correct. You know, that one there should obviously have been 40. So the scales do have to be, on both axes, increasing evenly. If you've got a line graph, your plots do need to be little X's, not dots or circles, little X's, please. Bar charts, obviously, you don't need to do little X's. But for bar charts and line graphs, it has to be accurate. It has to be perfect. If you are one teeny tiny square out from where you put your plot or put your bar, then you are wrong. And you will be marked down in exams. If you've got a, a line graph, then you do need a line of best fit. If you've got a bar chart, you don't need that step. And you, but you will absolutely need a title telling you what that graph is showing. So it may be, so if I just go back to mine. Um, so my one, obviously, if I was going to draw very quickly what mine would have looked like from the results table I did, I would have had independent variable on my x-axis. So before, after exercise, no unit needed. 
So before exercise would be a bar there, after exercise would be a bar there. Uh, on the dependent variable, it would be uh, heart rate and beats per minute. Hopefully that's come up. Nope, that's that's not coming up. Never mind. Uh, I promise you that would say heart rate in beats per minute. And again, that's where that would kind of go relatively evenly. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And of course, that's not coming up. Never mind, eh? Um, and yeah, the plot in terms of bars. So I think my mean was 60-ish for the before graph. And none of this is appearing on my screen. Never mind, eh? Well, uh, it's, it's thinking about it, just not doing it. Never mind. Uh, is what it is. My title, by the way, my title will be something like a graph to show how exercise affects your heart rate. Because that's what it's showing. It shows before exercise, shows after exercise, and it shows heart rate. Graph to show how exercise affects my heart rate. Boom. Uh, by the way, I would also just make this mention. I did three repeats on the mean. I wouldn't need to plot all the results there. I would only need to plot the mean. I don't need to plot my three different attempts. I just need to plot the mean. That's all. So I'd have one bar for before and one bar for after. Those bars would be the means of my heart rate. So when you're giving what went wells and you bet this to people, do make sure you are you are linking it to the points here on the left hand side. So a good what went well is you know actually drawing your bars or actually plotting all your points. A bad one is, oh I really like the pink pen you use, that's gorgeous. Bad what went well. Good EBI, so my y-axis scale was not increasing evenly, but I've corrected it in blue. Do make sure you correct things in blue, guys. We you you don't need to redraw your graph, that would take ages. Just just in blue, you know, do a little correction of what it could have looked like, should have looked like, um, to fix that EBI. A bad EBI is something like, it needs to be neater. No, just refer to these six points, please. If they generally have done it perfect, check with, you, check with your biology teacher if they're up and around. Otherwise, your EBI can quite simply be, there is no EBI. You are amazing, you are perfect, and I love you. Obviously, I wouldn't say that, but you might say that to your friends. You never know. Or if obviously you're marking it yourself because there's no one near you to be assessed, feel free to put EBI. I don't have any. I am awesome. Good for you. Anyway, that's the end of my video. Let's hope this one actually has recorded properly. Uh, yeah, see you again soon, guys. Bye. -bye.